In today's world, human life has been devalued. We forget, I say we as collectively as a nation, we seem to have forgotten the very tenets that this nation was founded upon. the dignity, value, and worth of every human being. And yes, that is foundational to, to this country and what it was founded upon. It is foundational to our faith. So today we will stand and proclaim Before we bow our heads in prayer, let me read from the book of Psalm, chapter 8, verses 4 and 5. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and has crowned him with glory and honor. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in praise and thanksgiving. We praise you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. Lord, we pray that you reveal unto us your will. Guide us towards it. Lord, we pray that you pour out your spirit, that you soften the hearts of, of all those that would hear this message, that you speak to their hearts. And Lord, we pray for revival, a new fire and a zeal in the hearts of believers, that you would use each and every one of us as your instrument. We pray, Lord God, that you heal the brokenness all around us, mend hearts, bring back together families. We pray that you heal this land, O oh God. We praise you, Lord God, for you alone are holy and righteous. We praise you for you alone are God. We praise you for the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we are saved. There is only one name under heaven in which we may be saved, and that is of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be with us always. We pray all this in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This last week, a young man, an off-grid farmer from Virginia named Oliver Anthony, broke the internet with a song he recorded titled, Rich Men, North of Richmond, was released on YouTube. This song speaks for the common and forgotten man and to the excesses of our political class in D.C. And it speaks to their thirst for power and control at our expense. While this song is powerfully delivered with an authenticity so rarely seen or heard today, the story behind the song is even more powerful and relevant to us. I'll share just a bit of his story with you today. Oliver Anthony, by his own account, lived his life 
antagonistically towards the very idea of God. He was ruled by his anger and his addiction to alcohol and was often overcome by his hardship and his sorrow. That is something each and every one of us can relate to, is it not? Just one month ago, Oliver Anthony came to Christ. He made a covenant with God. He stated that if he would get sober, he prayed that God would make his dreams come true to the glory of God. After 30 days sober, events in his life began to miraculously take place as God opened door after door for him. As of last evening, his song has been viewed millions of times. Today, Richmond, North of Richmond, is currently the most viewed song on the internet. Mr. Oliver Anthony has now been offered a recording contract. He shared his story online, giving all credit to God. Let us pray that this babe in Christ is protected, that he is guided, that God uses him and does not allow him to be gobbled up in that industry. A mighty work has begun in him and there will be a mighty work done through him. Even the worst enemies of God among men have come to repentance. The power of Christ to change lives, mend broken hearts, to make men new, raising dead men to life is seen in Scripture. It is seen beyond the pages of Scripture and in the world around. All of us, each day. I am reminded of Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus found in Acts chapter 9. I will read here verses 1 through 8. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priests and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. <clears throat> and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. I shared both the story of Oliver Anthony and of the conversion of Paul to highlight a point, that even the enemies of God, of which we all were prior to coming to Christ, we are all loved by God and called to repentance. I am reminded of my own past in this moment. There was a time when I, like Mr. Oliver Anthony, was antagonistic towards the gospel, towards the church, even towards God. 
I came back from that last deployment in Afghanistan with the belief that God had ordained all the atrocities of war and therefore was unworthy of worship. I did not understand the doctrine of free will, that the evils of war are perpetrated through the free will of man who of their own free will choose to do evil. It was not until God had opened up my heart, pulled back the scales that had been placed there by the world, where God had showed me his truth. The gentle call of the Holy Spirit, which touches our heart, reaches out to all. Saul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, by his own account, had been a great persecutor of the earliest Christians, being present at the death of the first martyr, Stephen. He, he that being Saul, hunted Christians in Jerusalem, effectively to the point that so many had fled the city. Not content to run Christians out of the city of Jerusalem, Saul was committed to rooting out all Christians and bringing them to prosecution before the Sanhedrin. It was on his journey to Damascus where Saul was visited by Jesus, our risen Lord. Confronted by his own error, his own injustices, his own sins by Jesus Christ. Saul was changed. Saul was converted and made new. Saul, now Paul, was set to purpose by God. Where Saul was once a great persecutor of the saints, now as Paul, he became a great champion for Christ. No matter how vile one may be, even a persecutor of believers, as in the case of Saul, now known as the Apostle Paul, none are beyond the grace and mercy of God. There is no sin so great that you cannot be forgiven, that that sin cannot be covered by the blood of Christ. God has placed value on all human life Amen. without exception. There is intrinsic worth for all, both great and small. The children of the rich are no more valuable than the children of the poor. God has crowned all men with glory and honor, just below that of angels, with dominion over all of his creation. That dominion over creation comes with a responsibility. This is true. Responsibility always accompanies authority. In fact, the responsibility often precedes the authority. What does it mean to be crowned with glory and honor? What are the implications of this truth? How do we live our life knowing how God has so crowned us all? The answer to these questions are both simple and profound. To be crowned with glory and honor is to be elevated above all creation, loved by God, endowed with intrinsic worth. From your conception, God has known, fully known, and loved you. He stitched you in your mother's womb. 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. He has called you to himself, offering you a pardon from the penalty of your sin through his grace and finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. From conception to death and to eternity, God loves you, each and every one of you. The implications are profound and huge. No man or woman has the authority to create or end life. That belongs to God alone. God has sanctified all human life. We dishonor that life when we corrupt ourselves and others with our sin. And no sin is as dishonoring as sexual immorality. We live our life honoring ourselves, God's creation, and most of all, honoring God through our love and obedience to Him. We allow, we must allow for our every word and deed to reflect the light of God through Jesus Christ in this world of darkness. We love God with every fiber of our being, making him the first of our love. And we love our neighbor as ourselves. You are crowned with glory and honor by God. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, from the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And when we go to the original Hebrew, the translation would be more closely attributed to thou shalt not murder. Kill and murder is often used interchangeably and is why we see it translated as such. But what is murder but at the unjust killing of another human being? In Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22, we read from the words of Christ himself, Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. See, it's not just what you do and you do not do. Christ is speaking to what is in your heart. The desire of your heart. A man can go his whole life and have never harmed another, but every waking moment was spent fantasizing about inflicting harm and death upon others. Can one say that that is truly a good and righteous man? No. Like most likely the only thing that stays his hand is the threat of punishment. It's not just what you do and do not do. It's not just what you say and do not say. It is what is in your heart. Later in that chapter, verses 43 to 48, we read, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? 
Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. We live in a violent world that grows ever more violent with each passing day. Human nature is to seek vengeance, which only results in the further perp uh, perpetuation of violence. Stub it a little bit. A wrong look or crass word is all that it takes for some to resort to a homicidal rage. We see, the, we see videos online of road rage. We read stories or, or see news reports where an individual had gone into a rage and had murdered one person, three people, multiple people. Why? They do not value human life, and they lack the control of their own emotions and faculties. Pride and ego with unbridled passions rule over the hearts of our young men who grew up oftentimes absent fathers in the home, who right now wreak havoc in our inner cities. They do not value human life not even their own. We know from Scripture that all human life is valued by God, that only God has authority over life and death, and that we are to be a beacon of God's love and mercy to all. We must proclaim to the young men of this nation all life has value to God and is worth preserving. Set aside your pain, anger, and your rage. Lay it all down at the foot of the cross. God stitched you in your mother's womb. Before your birth, God has fully known and loved you. Your life matters infinitely to our and your eternal God, whose love for you is so vast that God sent his son to die on the cross paying the penalty for your sin. Violence is not the answer. Jesus is always the answer. Amen? amen. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. Amen. Let us pray for children to be reconciled to their fathers, for broken homes to be made whole, for the demonic strongholds of crime and drugs to crumble and fall away. And that God's healing hand would renew the troubled and broken minds of our children and young people. Let the love of Christ shine through each of us, touching the lives of all that we meet. Let us pray for revival. Amen. Amen. You have been crowned with glory and honor by God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, we read, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Paul writes also in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 18 to 20. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? Which ye have of God. And ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. You're bought with a price, amen? Amen. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
This is further built upon in, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, <coughs> and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. I'm going to give you a moment to let that scripture seep in. See, just as murder and violence corrupts and destroys that which God has crowned with glory and honor, so too does sexual immorality. I would argue far more. Sexual immorality defiles the body and the soul, the very sanctity of God's most loved creation. That's you. We see this every day online and in our media. Young women and girls are selling their bodies online for clicks and internet fame. Even worse are those who give away their virtue to countless unnamed men. These poor young women have bought into the lie that their over-sexualized lifestyle and promiscuity is somehow empowering. Many are learning too late that they have ruined their chances for real love and fulfillment and ultimately have damaged themselves foundationally our society is sick ruled by its lusts let us weep with God for the damaged youth of our society and let us pray that God heals them and makes them whole God has another plan for us our bodies are temples for the Holy Spirit. God has ordained human sexuality for the confines of marriage alone. Let us be the change we want to see in the world. It's not enough to say it. We have to live it. You want a life with uh, a world with more love? Give more love. You want a world with more mercy and forgiveness? Be merciful and forgive. And let us do more than just speak this truth. Let us live this truth. Let us teach this truth to others, to our young men and our young women. Let us raise them up to value and respect themselves and others. It is time that we as believers reach out with compassion in our call to biblical purity. To young men and women, I tell you this with the hope that you will begin to see each other as God sees you. Each time you look at another with lust in your heart, remember that person is someone's baby boy or baby girl. It is a sin to reduce someone to some unnamed, some irrelevant individual, just a, a source of one's own gratification. To the young women here today, you are far more than just what you can give to someone else. You are crowned with honor and glory by God. <clears throat> Don't ever let someone treat you as if you are just a means to please themselves. You are more than that. God has crowned all of us, all of you, each of you, with glory and honor, and he has set you to purpose. Men today often fail to see women as anything more than a means 
for sexual gratification. Women often see their only value as their sexuality. There is more to life than that. It is time that men and women see themselves as God sees them, loved and cherished with intrinsic value, made in the image of God, crowned with glory and honor. Let us all pray for our youth that the children of this nation will be delivered from the sexual predation of degenerates. That the young men and women will see the value that God has placed upon them. That God will send down his healing hand to mend the brokenness in the hearts of our youth who have been seduced by the lustful spirit of this age. Let us pray for revival. Amen. You have been crowned with glory and honor by God. In Psalm 127, verses 1 through 5, we read, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has, hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Children are a blessing, amen. We have many parents here today. You know that I speak truth. The many blessings your children have bestowed upon you. Yes, there's been hard times. There's always hard time. The love and admiration of a small child is not something to be cast aside or devalued. Eugenics is a great evil that has manifested itself in many ways for well over a century. I could argue that eugenics has gone you can trace it back to the classical era and to the ancient era. The Romans practiced infanticide. Children that they didn't want or children that they felt were undeserving of their family name. They would cast them out into the, into the wilds. And it was Christians, the early Christians, there around Rome and in other Roman cities, that would gather up those cast-aside babies and raise them as their own. Before that, the Spartans, their children, whom they felt did not measure up, newly born, would be cast over a cliff. There was no surviving. They were dashed before the rocks below. Culture and civilization over time has all had this tendency to sacrifice even their own children. They lacked any concept of human value, dignity, and worth. Canada, just to the north of us, Supposedly a, a good and, and liberal democracy. For a long time I thought cherished freedom as we do. They have proved themselves in the last few years that that is not the case. Canada is now offering medically assisted suicide. And not just for the terminally ill, but for the poor and the homeless, those who just simply are struggling to pay their bills. But even worse, 
They're offering this medically assisted suicide for depressed teenagers. And they're doing so without any requirement for parental consent. I want you to think about that horror for a moment. How many teenagers get depressed? I did. And we often get depressed over things when we're teenagers that really aren't that big of a deal, but we've, let, we've yet to understand that. Because what, your children when you're a teenager? Whatever situation you find yourself in today may not be what you find yourself in tomorrow. But instead of allowing the parents to guide their children, they're saying, no, hey, why don't you just end it? We'll help you. I can think of few things more evil than that. This whole thing is nothing new. This was seen generations before as a logical uh, conclusion of Darwinian thought. That failed Austrian artist with the funny mustache embraced eugenics to purify what he referred to as a master race by first euthanizing the mentally ill and the infirm. This ultimately culminated in one of the greatest evils in human history. But he wasn't alone in the 20th century of this kind of evil. Stalin and the Soviet Union murdered countless millions of their own people. And they did that following the forced starvation of millions of Ukrainians in the Holodomor genocide. I can go on. Pol Pot. Fidel Castro in Cuba. Mao Zedong in China. the atrocities, the millions of deaths perpetrated by those who did not value human life. But this is no time for us to be self-righteous, to point our fingers at other nations and other peoples. Fifty years ago, our own Supreme Court invented a right that allowed women to murder their own children in utero, resulting in over 65 million deaths to date. Praise God that the Supreme Court has righted their wrong, though the damage has already been done. Many states have passed laws that have ended this murderous practice but unfortunately, many more have continued it. Some have expanded it. No life is more precious than that of the unbridled potential and joy of a newborn baby. And every mother here today knows that I speak truth. So many have eased their conscience by convincing themselves that the preborn are not yet human or alive. They have likewise convinced themselves that the preborn are nothing more than a, a, some type of parasite or a tumor to be removed. Somehow millions of women have been deceived into thinking that murdering their children in the womb is safe health care. When I think safe health care, it doesn't result in the death of a human being. There's nothing safe about that. But they, upon this proclamation of safe health care, they, they fail to mention the stories that so rarely get shared of the broken women who have fallen for these lies. 
This nation must be reminded of the sanctity of human life, the intrinsic value shared by all humanity, that even the preborn is crowned with glory and honor by God. The entire abortion industry would dry up and die. Think about this. It would all dry up and die if it were not for the rampant sexual immorality in our society today. It is no wonder then that the demonic powers that be are so focused on hyper-sexualizing our children and young people. Sexual immorality and fetal murder are intricately linked, folks. One would not exist without the other. We must stand on God's truth and pray. The answer is not to ridicule or harass women in front of clinics with name-calling. We are not to confront evil with evil. Rather, we must confront this great evil with love. I am reminded of a ministry that provides free mobile sonograms near clinics. Research has shown that when women see their baby on a sonogram prior to their appointment at an abortion clinic, they choose life 85% of the time. One cannot in good conscience end a pregnancy when they see their own child in the, room, in the womb. We need to seek God's word each day. We need to pray. God is bigger than this. Amen? Amen. We need to stand and speak for the preborn who have no voice of their own. And we must do so until this evil practice is purged from our nation. Let us remind the world that those little precious preborn babies are crowned with glory and honor by God. It is not enough for us to live our life oblivious to the evil around us. That is not what we are called to do. We cannot sit idly by while the world waxes more and more evil. We cannot go along to get along. We live in the world, but we are not of the world. We must never compromise the gospel and God's word to appease the modern sensibilities of this world. We must put on the full armor of God. Amen. And after doing all, we must stand. It is time that we stand and proclaim that all people are crowned with glory and honor by God. We are called to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are called to baptize all people. We are called to disciple believers. We are called to love God and to love one another. We are called to proclaim the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Jesus is coming again. Amen? Amen. What then shall you do when the evil of this world is before you? Will you turn and walk away? Will you put your head in the sand? Will you hide the light of Christ under a bushel? Will you go along to get along? Will you conform to the wickedness of the world to fit in? Will you deny Jesus to avoid persecution? I tell you, many will. Are you already living a double life, one for God and one for the world? You cannot serve two masters. Will you instead stand and proclaim Jesus Christ to the world? 
Amen and amen. Let us stand together this moment in every moment. Arm in arm with one voice and proclaim from this moment to our last. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. For all people are loved by God, crowned with glory and honor. Let us love God with all that we are. Let us love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Let us love one another with the same selfless, sacrificial love that God has shown us. Let us proclaim Jesus Christ till we are called home. For only Jesus is the solution to this fallen world. You are crowned with glory and honor by God, saved by his grace through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You are fully known and loved by God. From the greatest to the least of us, we are all equally loved and cherished by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe. We need prayer for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, and for our nation. We need a return to righteousness, a nation in service to God. We need revival. Revival starts in your heart. We shall stand and pray. As a church, we will stand and pray. And we call all believers to stand and pray with us, proclaiming to the world, Jesus Christ is risen, and he will come again. You can boil down much of the problems of this world to that very fact that so many do not value human life, not even their own. It is unique to the gospel of the value of human life. And let us now and always proclaim it. Stand and proclaim that all people are crowned with honor and glory by God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in praise and thanksgiving for your many, many blessings. Lord, we pray that you use this message to speak to the heart, to soften the hearts of those who hear it that you use this message to motivate believers to stand upon your principles and your truth, to stand for the dignity and value of all people, that you place in our heart a deep desire to pursue your will and to proclaim Jesus Christ to the world. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us live our lives in every way, with every word and every deed to your glory and to your good, proclaiming Christ. Be with each and every one of us today as we go our separate ways and bring us back again together next week. We praise you for you alone are holy and righteous that you alone are God. We pray all this in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, your Son, in whom we are saved. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.